My name is Alicia Ogawa. I've spent my career working in financial markets these days. I try to make uh, company executives and investors who are uh, putting money in those companies to be aware of these problems, to take responsibility for monitoring the safety of their supply chains. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the global launch of an innovative new program, Strengthening Health Systems to Reduce Lead Exposure. This program will strengthen national healthcare systems in Colombia, Peru, Kyrgyzstan, Indonesia, and Maharashtra, India, to better prevent, identify, and treat lead poisoning. In this hour, we'll hear from country representatives about this exciting project. I neglected to mention that I've been on the board of Pure Earth for three or four years now, and while I've learned many, many, many things, the most important thing I've learned is that these problems are solvable, and it only requires enough of us to be uh, aware, organized, and uh, to have the generous support of companies like Takeda Pharmaceutical to, um, to contribute to the solution of these problems. I'd like to thank Takeda Pharmaceutical's global CRS problem program for their support and to the Takeda employees for voting to award Pure Earth this grant. It's especially exciting because this is the first grant of its kind ever awarded anywhere in the world. We hope that other grant makers will follow the leadership of Takeda and invest in solving what is now recognized as one of the most urgent global health issues. Takeda Gyakuhin no Minasama, Kono Tabi no Kifu, Honto ni Arigato gozaimasu. I'd now like to introduce our incredible speakers that we have with us today, uh, Dr. Nitan Ambadai. Ambadai Kar, uh, who is the Director of Health Services, State Family Welfare Bureau, Poon, Maharashtra, India. Dr. Yi Lu, who is the Director of Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, Vital Strategies. Lizeth Olaya, Country Director at Pure Earth, Colombia. Budi Susulurini, De Director of Pure Earth, Indonesia Foundation. Rodrigo Velarde, Country Director of Pure Earth, Peru and Endira Jakipova, director of Ekois Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. To start, we're going to watch a very brief video with voices from stakeholders in each of the participating countries. five years, governments in Indonesia, Colombia, Maharashtra, Kyrgyzstan, and Peru will design and implement new programs to identify, monitor, and reduce lead exposure. By enhancing clinical education guidelines and capabilities, strengthening health surveillance technology, and educating teachers and parents, countries will be able to better protect children and future generations from lead poisoning. У каждого третьего ребенка во всем мире в крови содержится достаточное количество свинца, чтобы нанести необратимый неврологический, когнитивный и физический вред. El plomo es un metal tóxico que ingresa a nuestro sistema, ya sea a través de nuestra vía respiratoria o nuestra vía digestiva. Una vez que ingresa, a través de la sangre se distribuye en el cerebro, el hígado y los riñones. Ada berbagai macam sumbernya, termasuk daur ulang aki bekas dan lahan terkontaminasi timbal, serta produk seperti cat dan peralatan masak berbahan logam. Tenemos eh, algunas situaciones asociadas a exposiciones ocupacionales en las que las empresas que los manejan aún, los productos a base de plomo, no siguen todos los estándares que, que requerían para el, la prevención del riesgo de la exposición de sus trabajadores pada pekerja, kemudian mentransfer ke keluarganya termasuk kepada anaknya, itu sangat mungkin akan menyebabkan juga gangguan pertumbuh kembang, termasuk stunting dan bahkan perkembangan kognitif atau kemampuan uh, inteligensi dari anak-anak tadi.
El programa de fortalecimiento eh, de capacidades para mitigar la exposición a plomo consiste de cuatro fases que se establecen a partir de conocer cuáles son las capacidades actuales del país. This project will be conducted in collaboration and under the guidance of Government of Maharashtra, Government of India and in partnership with our local partner, Vital Strategies. The project is an amazing one. It's built on years of prior collaboration where we're really strengthening Peru's surveillance system, finding out who's exposed, from what, at how much of a level and where, uh, working with the healthcare system to really strengthen their ability to diagnose, treat, uh, and prevent exposure for their patients and for their communities, um, and to really uh, improve the way we talk about lead uh, in Peru. Nah, kami tentu menyambut baik eh, kerjasama dengan pihak-pihak ya mitra-mitra baik itu internasional maupun nasional untuk melakukan upaya-upaya terkait dengan eh, pencegahan dampak dari eh, pencemaran logam berat di lingkungan ini. И мы совместно со всеми партнерами, которые будут участвовать в данном проекте, сможем сохранить здоровье наших детей и очистить нашу землю от загрязнения свинцом и другими тяжелыми металлами. That was a great overview of the new program. I'd like to now invite our panelists to help us dive deeper into the project. Uh, I have one quick housekeeping note. Please add your questions uh, from the audience or your comments in the Q&A box, and we'll answer them after the panel discussion. So I'd like to direct this first question to Dr. Uh, Dr. Nitan Ambadaykar. What is this collective effort and project strengthening health systems to reduce lead exposure. Why is it important and relevant at an international level? Uh, uh, hi, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, allowing me to join this uh, important uh, discussion and launch event. So uh, in fact, the videos shown up till now has uh, explained it all. So why this is important? I just uh, uh, to summarize the same thing again, because uh, when we say like uh, it estimates are that 33 percent of the world children, and maybe more than 50 percent of the uh, children in middle and low income countries are affected by a high level of lead. So it's it's a, uh, in fact a very uh, alarming situation with more than 800 million children. Are suffering from the effect of lead. So uh, otherwise also, like uh, its effect are uh, seen in uh, so many things, like uh, in the children, it's like uh, developmental delays. And then more horrifying is it, it crosses the uh, your placental barrier and leading to uh, so many premature birth and low birth weight. So low birth weight is one of, one of the important problem in the low income countries and probably we need to know what is the contribution of this lead poisoning into that because that is a important issue which is leading to the infant and neonatal death in all these countries and apart from that it is estimated that around 1.4 to 8 million deaths are due to this lead poisoning and even the adults are like uh, affected most of the many of the cardiovascular uh, gamut of uh, diseases uh, may be precipitated by the uh, lead poisoning. So it is otherwise uh, seems to be a very important uh, health issue. It's old issues probably uh, brought forward uh, in, a, uh, now in a new light. And so uh, in the uh, countries like India, Maharashtra, where uh, there are uh, many issues to deal with this is and uh, to know uh, the basic root cause of so many uh, issues we can uh, definitely uh, need to tackle this uh, lead planning issue also so uh, the thing is that uh, with 
all this uh, global burden of uh, this late warming and uh, it's uh, changing the uh, supply chain and opening of all boundaries and uh, world we say now as a global village. So everything uh, which affects at one place is uh, really a important problem for other places also. So it's a global health uh, emergency if we see and the uh, burden of lead poisoning. And so uh, the most important thing is if uh, once it is uh, uh, we have a lead in the blood, it's really difficult to uh, remove it or to cure from it. So uh, as the old dictum and gold standard that to prevent, so, so, so as to prevent every, anything uh, disease, we need to create the awareness, involve all the health system, generate the uh, awareness in the health system as well as public and then political leadership need to be involved into that to tackle on the, such a large scale and to uh, create this all this environment. It's really uh, important to uh, uh, launch such type of program which uh, multi-country uh, dimensions and then the involvement of all the uh, development partners is also very important. And that's how we think to uh, look into this project that's really a, uh, that's how this project is, that's how this project is uh, important for our country and to the world to, to create the awareness and to show the uh, way forward how we can tackle this lead part. so I think uh, it's what is thank you thank you thank you very much Dr. Amba Daikar um I'd like to now ask about uh, the ambitiousness and the extensiveness of this project, its five-year project. How will the major objectives and milestones be achieved? Um, I'd like to ask Lizeth to take this question. Thank you very much, Alicia, for this important question. Uh, so this is a very exciting and challenging program uh, that aims to identify, monitor, and reduce lead exposure in the five countries where it's implemented. As you mentioned, it's very important to achieve the goals and objectives and milestones that are proposed for this process. So the work plan is divided in four phases, as you might see briefly in the video. So in the first phase, we are going to strengthen our knowledge about the healthcare systems in the different countries, including lab capacity and infrastructure. And this information will be key inputs for developing a capacity plan that we can support the ministries of health in order to improve the monitoring of lead exposure. In a second phase, uh, we are joining efforts with all of the local institutions in order to improve uh, the collection of data regarding environmental health. From my perspective and all my colleagues, uh, the core activity of this process is the blood lead level testing in children. And in the five countries, we are going to analyze around 5,000 children per country. This information is a key input for doing and building the integrated national databases that are the first step to develop and design and improve the national surveillance systems. Jointly with that, and in a third phase, we will be focused on characterizing and identifying um, the sources of pollution, as was, was mentioned, is a pretty important process in, in this project, as well as the pathways of exposure. This is important for us to have a better knowledge of the presence of these kind of sources in the different countries. And with this information, it will be very, very important to collect the data through a source assessment, to train the people and to collect the data. And this data will be collected mainly uh, through the home-based assessment uh, methodologies. One of my colleagues is, is telling you about this in, in deeper detail uh, further. And last but not least, the fourth phase of this process uh, is we will put all of our energy and efforts for training health professionals, professors, and community leaders in order for them to be able to enhance their capabilities to early identify, prevent, and treat a lead poisoning in children. And as well, it's very important to have in con into consideration the communities and the children because they are the main exposed uh, population and vulnerable in this process in order to mitigate the risk about environmental health issues. The, support, the project as well will support 
uh, the health and pollution uh, consulting centers. The mission of these centers uh, is to coordinate actions in order to mitigate uh, those risks regarding health environmental issues. Uh, and as well to assist and consult families uh, with children that present high blood level levels uh, to receive treatment. Here in Colombia, uh, is as well as I mentioned at, at the beginning, is quite challenging process, uh, but we are totally sure that the key successful factor for this process is the leadership of the ministries of Environment of health in all of the countries, as well as the involvement of other ministries like the Ministry uh, of Environment. This is here is a relevant and very impactful process because we convene diverse actors from the perspective of the regulation, the politics, uh, research, practice, and the future challenges that come with this issue in the country. And the lead poisoning prevention uh, is a topic that raises the interest of the national interest because it's closely related to another topics uh, that are, are being discussed here in Colombia as the, in general, the heavy metals uh, poisoning. We consider that the confluence of diverse actors uh, contribute to mainstream the situation in the country. So in summary, and to give uh, some time to my, to my colleagues, by awareness raising, but improving uh, the surveillance system, identifying the sources, enhancing the capability, the clinical capabilities, and educating teachers, professors, children about the danger of lead, uh, we were gonna be able, and the countries will be able uh, to protect, to better protect the children of health and the future generations. And we truly believe that this process and is our uh, main expectation that the countries could have tools to promote, enact, propose policies that are sound and cost-effective in order to be able to attend the sources of these issues. And as well, it's very important to promote a culture of prevention among the society. Thank you very much, Liza. Thank you for the great answer, the, the uh, extensive answer, and thank you very much for the work that you're doing in Colombia. I think one of the important things to note about Liza's answer is the degree to which um, she is involving the community, the families, uh, the local network, which is a signature of, of many of the programs that, that Pure Earth runs. So um, we've just heard that designing and implementing a sustainable blood lead level surveillance program for each country is one of the main outcomes of this project. Could we take a step back and ask, what is a blood lead surveillance system and how do you build such a system? Perhaps I could ask Dr. Li Yilu to address that. Yeah, thank you, Alyssa, for the question. Um, so when we say surveillance, we mean a continuous and systematic way of collecting information and analyzing this information that can be helpful for public health and planning and practices. Um, so for uh, blood lead surveillance, it often involves measuring the blood level in the population. Um, so blood level, level is a very important biomarker that helps us understand a child's current lead exposure and also um, knows the potential health impacts for them. So this is often done by taking a capillary, so your finger uh, or venous blood samples, and then the, uh, this will be sent to tested by a portable analyzer or in the laboratory. Um, and this also can involve some of collecting information that can be helpful evaluating an individual's risk of lead exposure. So using Vito's recent experience in Bihar, India, as an example, uh, we visited homes that were randomly selected from eight districts in Bihar, and the field team took a few drops of blood from a child's finger um, and measured it using a portable analyzer that they brought to the home. They then conducted a questionnaire that asked uh, with the child's uh, giver and then asked about questions that um, about the household and the child's behavior. And these questions are often related to the potential lead exposure at homes, um, such as living with a parent who work in a lead-related occupation or frequently eating soil or paint by the child. Um, and at the end of the visit, the team will share the blood lead level with the child and uh, with the family and go through recommendations based on the results. 
Um, and surveillance can take many different formats. It can go, uh, be done through active surveillance by measuring the blood levels in a national survey or using a sample of the population, such as how it's been done in the US through the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, and also a few recent pilot efforts that have been completed in Georgia, the Philippines, and Peru. Um, or it can be done through passive surveillance where the young child visits the pediatricians and the pediatrician will recommend taking a blood test and then the results will be then reported by the doctor or the laboratories uh, to the health departments. And in some cases, the health departments will uh, take some follow-up actions to investigate and also provide care for a child uh, if they were detected with a high blood level. So what are we, we are hoping to build in this program is a government-led surveillance that will provide national and state data that can help the government understand how many children are at risk of lead poisoning, uh, what are the high, uh, what are the communities that are at high risk, and also potential um, sources of lead exposure. Um, we're taking several important steps to build this system. So first of all, we're building partnership with the national and state governments and all important stakeholders locally um, to understand the local needs and also uh, design a surveillance approach that is best suited um, for what is available uh, and, and the existing infrastructure. Um, this also involves raising awareness of the lead as important public health issues in some countries because sometimes it can be seen as a localized problem that is only affecting areas with high pollution from uh, activities like mining or battery recycling. So second, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned in uh, one of our go, uh, we're also assessing the local laboratory capacity for testing blood lead levels, uh, which is generally limited in these countries that we're working in. Um, therefore, we're also exploring opportunities to improve the long-term testing capacity, um, especially within the public uh, sectors by providing technical or financial support. Um, this will also involve aggregating existing data on the lead exposure for example, the lead in the drinking water and the soil and developing effective risk uh, a, a screening questionnaire that can help evaluate a child's risk of lead exposure when the blood lead testing is extremely limited. Um, so last but not least, uh, we'll also need to train the local health worker to adapt the lead screening practices. Um, this will be particularly important, and I'll mention it later as well, uh, for building passive surveillance, which rely on reporting from the physicians and the laboratories, uh, which then in turn relies on how uh, commonly a blood lead test is conducted and recommended. Um, so hope this answers your question. Back to you, Alicia. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. It's another example of building from the ground up um, such an extensive effort. Um, Rodrigo, I'd like to ask you, Peru is one of the first low or middle income countries where lead poisoning surveillance systems has been uh, tested and piloted. Could you take us through the different phases of health surveillance from the perspective of a mother or father who suspects that their families may have been exposed to lead I mute. Sure, Alicia. I think it's a great question, and I would like to uh, explain it in a really simple way. First of all, we start with a suspected exposure. So, if you're a father or a mother of a children that has a suspicious idea that you're living under a possible exposure to heavy metals, first of all, you should go directly to your nearest health facility, and they will start the research. This research is separated in two, in, in two themes. First, the environmental, that they will evaluate the water, the air, and the soil. And there's also an epidemiological research. We have an instrument called Ficha Epidemiologica, which is similar like the questionnaire that Dr. Yi mentioned before. This questionnaire will evaluate like the materials of your house, uh, what kind of economic uh, activities you develop over there. And the health facility will gather all this information and it will take it to the Ministry of Health. And depending on that results, they will create an action plan. Let's assume that you are living in an area where there's a presence of lead, for example, the metal that we're talking about. With that, 
The Ministry of Health will create an action plan. So they will contact the local health facilities and they will look for the children that are living under the geographical area that can probably will be impacted. First, they will take some data from the family and they will take the children to the facility and evaluate in four specific things. First, a growth and development evaluation, then a nutritional evaluation, then an anemia evaluation, and a psychological evaluation. And if the physician thinks that uh, these kids need an extra exam, they will run it. Depending on those results, the physician will select those kids that needs to be taken to another facility to make a blood lead test. This blood sample will be taken back to Lima, where there's the main laboratory for the program, for the surveillance system, sorry. And then with the results, they will return to the local facility, to the initial facility, remember, where you're living, and they will give you the results. And together with the physician, they will give you some advice on how to solve or how to manage the situation. So this is in a really simple way. I hope everyone understands how the surveillance system works here in Peru. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. That was uh, that was really fascinating. Um, another major part of this project is assessing and identifying and documenting the main sources of lead exposure in children. Yayasan Pure Earth Indonesia and the University of Indonesia have just completed a blood lead level survey and household source analysis in highly polluted locations on Java Island. Budi, could you please tell us more about this and how it was achieved? What methodologies did you use that could be applied to other countries? Thank you, Alicia. Good evening from Jakarta, everyone. So in May to August 2023, a team which comprised Pure Earth Indonesia Foundation and the Occupational and Environmental Health Research Center of the Faculty of Medicine of Universitas Indonesia with support from the Health Polytechnic of Yogyakarta did blood lead level study and home-based assessment at four lead exposed um, areas and one control area on Java Island in Indonesia. Before the field work, the team had a training in compliance with uh, the protocol that uh, has been approved by the ethical committee. Based on uh, uh, blood lead level test, the team visited houses of children with blood lead level higher than 20 microgram per deciliter at lead exposed areas, while at control area, the team did random home visit. In total, the team at that time visited 145 houses and performed home-based assessment, which combines um, questionnaires, um, observations and also measurements of the environment around and inside the houses, as well as the products used daily. So it, it includes um, soils, water used for consumption, dust, clothes, cooking and eating utensils, spices, cosmetics, and paints. Samples were, uh, were measured um, in location using portable X-ray fluorescence and some were sent to an accredited uh, laboratory. The objective of this exercise was to determine the household um, items that show biggest concentration on lead in the houses where children with high blood lead level. Hence, we try to establish which sources of lead exposure can be associated with lead poisoning among children in the um, studied areas. We collected a lot of samples, so it is uh, very essential to make sure to put the right code in every sample. So truly, the whole process was a lot and intense, but we have a solid team with good combination of expertise on health and environment. Pure Earth Indonesia Foundation and our partners um, shared strong commitment, spirit, and value for healthier and better future of our children. Other things uh, that we learn are sim similar to blood lead level testing. The implementation of home-based assessment is very dependent 
and community participation. Therefore, it is very important to coordinate with local um, resources. So this includes um, health offices, community health um, centers, and health cadres for their support and involvement. I think this has been emphasized by Lizeth that collaboration is a key aside from um, technical matters. Along the way, we also discussed with our partners and did necessary adjustments considering situations and the need of study in Indonesia. We also need to understand and respect local culture. There can be local uh, cultural differences between one location and another. The experience that we gain from this study is certainly very useful for implementing the same protocol and approach um, in this program um, supported by Takeda. So, we are uh, thankful that now we can reach out to more children, um, Alicia. The results uh, will help us to better understand the sources of lead exposure and plan for appropriate intervention and measures. Thank you, Alicia. Back to you. Thank you, Budi. Thank you for your work. It's very encouraging to hear of all the progress that you're making. Um, I'd now like to direct a question again to Dr. Ye. Uh, you know, you mentioned, you touched on this earlier, but training healthcare professionals to diagnose and treat lead poisoning on a national scale is another part of this project that I'd like to hear more about. Uh, why is this so important and how are you planning to deliver this education at such a broad scale? Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Happy to take this question. Um, yes, we think it's very important to provide trainings uh, for healthcare professionals, um, particularly we're meaning that family doctors, nurses, pediatricians, and community health workers in some rural settings, um, because they're often the first one to encounter uh, the children with lead exposure, and their awareness directly affected whether this child with lead poisoning will be timely detected and treatment uh, treated. Um, we all we often call lead poisoning a silent and insidious killer, uh, because even though uh, a child have low to moderate um, lead exposure, they may not show any uh, obvious clinic symptoms. Even at a high level, the child might complain about a series of uh, symptoms that are non-specific, such as a headache or abdominal pain that can often be confused by uh, with other common diseases in the country. Um, because of this, a doctor's awareness about asking a child's history of lead exposure and also recommending a blood test for a high-risk child at young age is particularly critical in identifying a child that is poisoned by lead. It is also important to equip the knowledge on managing lead exposure so when the, the, the doctor is providing a uh, uh, a care for the child. Uh, they can also educate the parents um, how to uh, how to identify and reduce the lead exposure and remove that from their home environment while the child is receiving assessment and care. Um, but unfortunately, uh, based on our conversation with our local stakeholders, um, the awareness of lead poisoning is still fairly low among the healthcare professionals in the five locations that we're working in. Um, while we don't have data for all of them. Um, we had a survey that we conducted among medical students in Indonesia before that showed that one in three students had poor or no knowledge of lead poisoning, and this is concerning. So we hope to build a, build a, a training that can reach many healthcare professionals and is likely to be sustained after the conclusion of the program. Um, and therefore, we're planning to uh, use the train the trainer model. Um, some people might have already heard about that, um, but the general approach just include um, identifying government and uh, local partners that are can serve as trainers and also with existing training uh, networks to reach the health professionals that we're hoping to reach, and then adopting the international training materials and piloting it with the local trainer. As Budi mentioned, that we will need to respect all the cultural differences in different other countries, um, and then facilitate the delivery of these trainings through the local trainers over time. Um, and for the local partners, we're first thinking about uh, partnership with the government and organizations like the Minister of Health, uh, Medical Association, the uh, Community Health Worker Networks uh, that have the mandate and the extended network that can deliver these training uh, to the healthcare workers, uh, 
workers that were um, thinking relevant and can reach the the, the children. Um, and the training format and delivery are likely going to be varied by different countries. Uh, but we're hoping that we can use a more accessible format like an online webinar or e-courses. Um, so the healthcare professional can uh, access it anywhere and at any time. Uh, but of course, the concern is about the engagement. So we're also hoping to combine it with some incentives to encourage the completion, such as by giving continuous uh, medical education credits or incorporating it into existing certification program. So hopefully through this, we can really build a training that is uh, reaching the health professionals that are playing an important role in addressing lead poisoning um, at a scale. It's very striking to me that all the speakers have mentioned or have talked at length about training and raising awareness of this problem. So I'd like to ask a final question that I'll direct to Indira um, about this. If the crucial component of this project is the education and awareness raising are aimed at teachers, students, parents, um, healthcare professionals. So Indira, you've been working for years in exactly this area in raising awareness about pollution. Uh, you've been proactively communicating around lead issues and engaging with local communities. What are your plans for educating these target audiences further? And how can all of us and your colleagues benefit from your past experience? Thanks, Indira. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, um, communication activities uh, will follow a global plan, but I will explain the way we are working in Kyrgyzstan as the standard methodology. Uh, before initiating work in the country, we conducted uh, several focus group discussion, which uh, revealed the, the following. Uh, there is a lack of uh, evidence-based information uh, regarding lead exposure and uh, uh, lead poisoning. Uh, the country lacks uh, laboratories capable of determining lead levels in the blood and um, health care providers have limited knowledge about blood level, lead level, uh, testing and treatment. Government agencies at both uh, the central and the regional levels are insufficiently involved and aware of the lead exposure issue. Uh, there is uh, a low public awareness about lead exposure among NGOs, businesses, scientific community, uh, and the general uh, public. Um, the country in general lack lacks experience in regulating and monitoring lead in the environment, um, as well as mechanisms for regulating the use of lead materials and ensuring safe disposal of lead-containing waste. As a summary, I can say that the general level of awareness regarding lead-related health risks is extremely low in Kyrgyzstan. When I say focus group, I mean uh, the main targets. It's Ministry of Health uh, and its divisions like uh, Department of Disease Prevention, uh, um, Republican Center for Health Promotion, uh, laboratories under the Health Ministry, uh, donor community, UN agencies like uh, WHO, UNDP, UNICEF, uh, international organizations like uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers, uh, uh, family doctors, um, experts, NGO representatives, uh, uh, media, research institutes, uh, local communities. Um, to address this issue and uh, challenges, we have uh, identified the, the key messages. First, the lead is hazardous to health. The second, lead is especially dangerous for the children. And everyone should know the sources of lead poisoning. Um, we will implement a public awareness campaign in uh, the target regions to raise awareness about lead exposure, its uh, physical and uh, neurological risks, and uh, the benefits of risk reduction, testing, and treatment. Um, the approach uh, will uh, involve uh, 
uh, engage in direct outreach to the population through stands, posters, cartoons, media reports, and other means, expand the presence of the problem in the information field through consultations during doctor's visits, uh, school lessons, uh, expert interviews during prime time, and uh, thematic uh, content in social networks and uh, reputable medical professionals pages. Um, we will disseminate information about project uh, progress and milestones to local, regional, and global health policymakers through various uh, channels, uh, um, including uh, utilize existing channels of information dissemination among health workers, such uh, as uh, the Republican Center for Health Promotion and Mass Communication under the Health Ministry of Kyrgyz Republic, um, uh, leverage social networks uh, and messengers like uh, Instagram, Telegram, and Facebook, which is popular in now country, to share stories, caption videos, uh, infographics. Uh, of course, additionally, utilize YouTube. It's one of the most popular channel of information in our country. The previous uh, project uh, has produced valuable communication materials, including a book for children and the book titled Lead and Children's Health for Parents. These uh, materials provide um, essential information about lead-related health risks and uh, methods to reduce exposure and uh, can be reprinted for use. This project uh, implemented 2016-2018 in our country. Um, education activities uh, in local uh, communities, we'll call it hotspots, uh, uh, will um, go through deliver lectures to children in middle and high school, uh, conduct meetings with parents, uh, offer classes and interactive activities, uh, organize games with young children in kindergartens uh, and primary schools. Um, this uh, comprehensive plan aims to increase awareness and understanding of lead exposure and its associated risk among various target groups, ultimately working towards mitigating lead-related health concerns. Thank you. Back um, to you. Thank Alice. you very much, uh, Indira. I think um, the three, you know, you've boiled it down to three very powerful messages. Lead is hazardous to health. Lead is especially dangerous for children. And everyone should know the sources of lead pollution. This is very simple, very powerful uh, messages. And I hope you don't mind if I steal them for when I talk to people here in America. Um, well, that is uh, the end of our panel discussion. And uh, I want to turn to some of the questions that have arisen from our audience. And thank you to the audience for uh, raising these questions. The first question that I'd like to direct to Dr. Lee, we have somebody in the audience who's asking, what will be the criteria for selecting children in your population for blood level, lead level testing? Ideally, I suppose you'd like to test everybody, but we'll what criteria will you use for targeting um, the population in your area? Yeah, Alicia, thanks for the question. Um, yes, this is really uh, helpful to clarify because it really also relies on the purpose of the surveillance and then what type of surveillance that we will do. So this, again, like I mentioned, that it will be uh, depends on the local need, the, the local government's needs, and then what will be the best plan suited for each of the countries. So this might vary a little bit. But in general, uh, we want to focus on young children, the, the children who are under the age of five, because because they're most vulnerable uh, to lead exposure uh, because of their behavior, because they're developing body, um, they're actually more exposed to lead. They, they, uh, they exposed and absorb more lead. For example, they have a hand to mouth behavior that uh, expose them more to lead. Um, and also uh, they're also more vulnerable to the health impacts of lead. So we know that at very low level, uh, lead already affects the, the, the brain and development of a child. And this can be a long-term and some of the effects are irreversible that they will carry through uh, over their life. So one of the first thing that we do want to focus on is identify uh, the levels in young children and then prevent that from future uh, exposures. Um, and 
what are the other thing that uh, depends on the design of the surveillance? So if we're thinking about what we call more of active surveillance, like through a national survey, then normally we want to sample a population that is representative uh, for the nation or for the state. So uh, in that way, we will have a random probability sampling that sample a subset of the population. It might not be such a big sample size, but it's enough to have representativeness of the country. Um, so that's one, one other criteria that we might do through our different sampling design. Um, and then Going again, if it's a passive surveillance that have been, for example, conducted in some of the U.S. cities or states, uh, what they will do is that they either do universal recommendation for testing, which all the children under age of two might be tested, uh, be, might be recommended for uh, blood that testing when they visit a doctor, or in some areas if they live what they consider as a high risk area. So they have existing data on what is the lead in the drinking water, whether there are a large proportion of O housing in some parts of the, the city and then the children living in that city will be that part of the city will be recommended for having a blood lab testing so that will be more of like based on the child's existing risk then you recommend whether the child receive a blood lab testing or not so these are different kind of ways of selecting who will be tested for blood lab testing but again going back to my point earlier that it also depends on what is the availability of the testing the blood lead test and how it's accessible to the people and how affordable it is. Yeah. Yeah. Another reason to thank uh, Takeda and our other supporters for contributing to that effort. Um, I'd like to now ask um, Budi a uh, question from the audience is what are the differential contributions <clears throat> to high blood lead levels from different potential exposure sources? Thank you for the question, Alicia. At this point, the analysis from our recent study is still going. So uh, it's uh, still difficult to say from all the sources, which one is the most contributing and to put uh, the rank or the level of um, its um, source um, into the elevated uh, BLL. But uh, for the study areas where we did um, the home-based assessment, we must say that um, lead exists in air, water, and also soil. And from the study also, we could say that the uh, lead contamination in soil maybe will uh, or uh, it is going to be the great uh, contributor uh, to the elevated uh, BLL. So far, we have identified some uh, contributing factors to elevated uh, BLL. Uh, among others are uh, the um, socioeconomy. And also, if you if the children um, live in the um, late, late um, exposed area. So if children live in live in a late exposed area, their risk will be 3.83 higher than uh, the same children who does not live in a late exposed area. Other um, uh, source of late exposure is also the um, aluminum cookware and also footwear. And... Uh, Different from uh, the condition in other countries where um, spices in color uh, is high with lead, but the study that we did in, in Indonesia showed that the use of um, spices that is not yellow and red is actually um, raised the risk of uh, children will, uh, with high um, um, blood lead level. Another thing is um, the cleanliness of house. Houses because we also found like a um, high lead concentration in dust when we do the um, uh, home based assessment. So, um, uh, following up uh, after the result of the study, we returned to the sites with the study team uh, as well as the medical doctors to provide outreach and one-to-one -one counseling um, to the subjects. So one of the advice that we provided to the subjects is yeah, to make sure that they keep their houses clean by uh, keep doing sweeping, mopping, uh, to, uh, so that they can do it uh, every day, at least once a day. So hopefully it will help them to keep away uh, lead contamination from the houses. <clears throat> Back to you, Alicia. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Budi. I mean, you have raised this in your earlier comments and one or two other people. It's not only uh, the challenges of uh, economics and technology, but the cultural challenges that uh, need to be addressed. And therefore, the work that you and all your colleagues are doing on an awareness and education are so important. Um, I have a question that's directed to, um, uh, to Lizbeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it comes from one of our friends at the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. Uh, so to Lizeth, how do you protect the children that you that have gotten blood samples during and after the exercise that you're carrying out? And how will you, uh, Alaya, strengthen the community health systems to address and respond to childhood-led exposure? So perhaps I could ask Lizette to answer the first question. How do you protect the children that you have gotten blood samples from during and after the exercise? Thanks, Alicia, and thank you uh, for the question. Uh, in this case, we are going to manage to do a case management guidelines as per WHO uh, guidelines for the more severe cases and helping and in contribution with the local health providers. This in the in, in parallel to help parents, teachers, and local governments to identify the source of exposure. As I mentioned at the at the beginning. We believe that in this case, the information is power. And as much as we can not prevent uh, these cases, uh, we will be able to protect the children. So in those both cases, for the critical ones, uh, uh, follow up the guidelines of WHO and the identification of sources. Right, and the second question, yeah, to strengthen the community health systems. Um, is there anything else you want to add about that? Uh, oh yes, of course. In the in the fourth phase, uh, we are uh, designing modules, training modules, and in this one of these cases, uh, the training material is foreseen to be able to attend different target groups. So it's pretty different to attend or to design a guide for a professional, for a health professional, than for a child or a parent. So we here in Colombia have a really good examples of community reach, outreach uh, through material, didactic material, as uh, indeed I was mentioning in their in their answer. There is a lot of tools to achieve and uh, to get to this target group. So it will be done uh, by the fourth phase of the process. Great. Um, another question from the audience, which goes to Dr. Yi. Um, are IMCI adaptation guidelines available for identifying suspected children for blood lead levels, or are other clinical management algorithms available? Yeah, Alicia, thanks for the question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I think the IMCI will probably stands for Integrated Management of Childhood Illness. Um, I'm not sure, uh, uh, completely uh, sure whether lead screening is included in the, the guideline for MCI, but I know that uh, Liz just mentioned that the World Health Organization did release a clinical guideline on how to manage lead exposure among children and pregnant women uh, in 2021, I believe. Um, and it did talk about, you know, what uh, type of actions like either nutrition interventions or removal, of course, removal of lead exposure is the first action you need to take. Um, and then also uh, chelation, uh, what the what conditions are suitable for chelation therapies. Um, so there is the WHO uh, clinical guideline. We've also been working with, uh, in Peru, I know that in Indonesia, there are also efforts of developing or updating uh, the clinical management guideline uh, related to lead exposure. Um, and one of the components that, uh, you know, I think it's really valuable from these clinical guidelines is to think about using what we call risk assessment screening tools. So by uh, you know, aggregating the data from uh, lead exposure in the environment in the area by like understanding lead in the water, in the soil, or whether there's so uh, uh, pollution sources in the area, then we can estimate whether the child is from a what we call like a high, maybe ha at high risk. And then you can recommend the child whether they should be receiving a blood lead testing or not. Um, in a way, this is helpful for some of the uh, countries that with limited resources of blood lead tests. Um, so that's another kind of uh, development that we were aware of some of these clinical guidelines. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm not particularly sure. I hope this answers the question, but there are some guidelines and there are some countries also developing the guidelines, but um, I'm not aware whether it's part of the IMCI guidelines. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, 
I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in the webinar. Um, there's been an enormous amount of information here. I've learned a lot. And I want to thank Dr. Yi, Lizeth, Rodrigo, Indira, and Dr. Amba Daikar for their obvious passion, commitment, uh, and the warmth and kindness that you all radiate. So I want to thank you. For the audience, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to the Pure Earth team at info at pureearth.org. Uh, I'd like to mention that a recording of this launch event of this ambitious new plan will be accessible on the web pro on the project website, reduceleadexposure.org. Uh, for more updates, please follow Pure Earth on social and so on social media and sign up for our newsletter. Um, I hope you can all agree that this is a really crucial and promising partnership. If you or others are interested in supporting this kind of work, please reach out to us. And once again, we'd like to appreciate our deep appreciation to Takeda Pharmaceuticals for their generous support. Take care. Have a good day wherever you are.